In the sixth part of the Earth in Upheaval series, we will explore the chapter called the Aquatic Graveyards. In this chapter, Velikovsky is attempting to show evidence of mass extinction across what appear to be shallow oceans. The evidence he discusses shows not only that many species died at the same time, but also that this appears to have happened very quickly and possibly very dramatically. He opens by examining what is known as the Old Red Sandstone Strata. This strata is the oldest known strata with signs of mass extinction. The Old Red Sandstone is an assemblage of rocks in the North Atlantic region, largely of Devonian age. It extends in the east across Great Britain, Ireland and Norway, and in the west along the northeast seaboards of North America. It also extends northwards into Greenland and Svalbard. The body of rock is dominated by alluvial sediments and conglomerates at its base, and progresses to a combination of dunes, lakes and river sediment. The red colour comes from iron in the sediment. Within the old red sandstone strata you will also find a whole series of fossils comprising plants, arthropods and early fishes. These fossils are found in very high quantities. The main consensus is that the old red sandstone strata was laid down by sediments from primarily lakes and riverbeds across the former continent of La Russia. One of the first works Velikovsky cites is that of Hugh Miller. He was a Scottish geologist who became preoccupied with studying the old red sandstone. He was not actually a trained geologist, but became interested in this due to his work in quarries as a stonemason. Most of his knowledge came from his fieldwork and through his extensive reading. The old red sandstone was first published in 1841 and was a very popular book amongst many scholars and the general public, so much so that it ended up with 14 editions and is still in print today. Velikovsky opens with Hugh Miller's work as it sets a very dramatic scene where the shallow ocean that was Scotland became the setting for a catastrophic event whose scars are seen not only in the fossil records, but the rocks themselves. A wonderful record of violent death falling at once, not on a few individuals, but on whole tribes. The earth had already become a vast sepulchre to a depth beneath the bed of the sea equal to at least twice the height of Ben Nevis over its surface. Miller found that the hardest masses in this stratum were porphyries of vitreous fracture that cut glass as readily as flint, and masses of quartz that strike fire quite as profusely from steel are yet polished and ground down into bullet-like form. And yet it is surely difficult to conceive how the bottom of any sea should have been so violently and so equally agitated for so great an extent to space and for a period so prolonged that the entire area should have come to be covered with a stratum of rolled pebbles of almost every variety of ancient rock, fifteen stories height in thickness. Some terrible catastrophe involved in sudden destruction the fish of an area at least a hundred miles from boundary to boundary, perhaps much more. The same platform in Orkney as at Cromarty, is strewed thick with remains, which exhibit unequivocally the marks of violent death. The figures are contorted, contracted, curved. The tail in many instances is bent around to the head. The spines stick out, the fins arc spread to the full, as in fish that die in convulsion. The terichthys shows its arms extended at its stiffest angle, as if prepared for an enemy, the attitude of all the ichthyolites on this platform are attitudes of fear, anger and pain. The remains too appear to have suffered nothing from the after-attack of predaceous fish. None such seem to have survived. The record is one of destruction at once, widely spread and total. What agency of destruction could have accounted for the innumerable existences of an area perhaps 10,000 square miles in extent, annihilated at once. Conjecture lacks footing in grappling with the enigma, and expatiates in uncertainty over all the known phenomena of death. What is interesting is that Miller viewed the sudden deaths of so many species to not be linked with the destruction of the environment itself. There are proofs that whatever may have been the cause of the catastrophe, it must have taken place in a sea unusually still. Destruction must have come in the calm, 
and it must have been a kind by which the calm was nothing disturbed. In what could it have originated? By what quiet but potent agency of destruction were the innumerable existences of an area perhaps 10,000 square miles in extent annihilated at once, and yet the medium in which they had survived left undisturbed by its operations? This last part was omitted by Velikovsky. Miller goes on to discuss how a disease could also not explain this either. Diseases of mysterious origin break out at times in the animal kingdom, and well nigh exterminate the tribes of which they fall. But the ravages of no such disease, however extensive, could well account for some of the phenomena of this platform of death. It is rarely that disease falls equally on many different tribes at once, and never does it fall with instantaneous suddenness whereas in the ruin of this platform, from 10 to 12 distinct genera seem to have been equally involved and so suddenly did it perform its work that its victims were fixed in their first attitude of terror and surprise. Miller then also rules out the possibility of nearby volcanic activity. Fish have been found floating dead in shoals beside submarine volcanoes, killed either by the heated water or by mephitic gases, there are, however, no marks of volcanic activity in connection with the ictilite beds. But this is not the only place that there is evidence of such catastrophes. Velikovsky quotes from a variety of other sources to demonstrate that this phenomena was not just restricted to the old red sandstone. The first person he references is W. Buckland, who we have previously discussed when we looked at the caves of Europe. Buckland covers the finds near Verona in North Italy, which is one of the richest sources of fossils in Europe. This strata is believed to be much more recent in comparison to the old redstone strata. The circumstances under which fossil fish are found at Mont Bolca seem to indicate that they perish suddenly. The skeletons of these fish lie parallel to the lamina of the strata of the calcareous slate. They are always entire and closely packed on one another. All these fishes must have died suddenly, and have been speedily buried in the calcareous sediment, then in the course of deposition. From the fact that certain individuals have even preserved traces of colour upon their skin, we are certain that they were entombed before decomposition of their soft parts had taken place. Another celebrated deposit of fossil fishes is that of the cupiferous slate surrounding the hearts. Many of the fishes of this slate at Mansfeld, Eiselben, etc., have a distorted attitude which has often been assigned to the writhing in agonies of death. As these fossil fishes maintain the attitude of their rigid stage immediately succeeding death, it follows that they were buried before putrefaction had commenced, and apparently in the same bituminous mud, the influx of which had caused their destruction. He then quotes from George McCready's Evolutionary Geology and New Catastrophism. Interestingly, one of the main sources George McCready cites is that of Miller's old red sandstone. Velikovsky uses this to demonstrate more examples of preserved fish in North America. In the North American similar strata, packed full of splendidly preserved fish, are found in the black limestones of Ohio and Michigan, in the green riverbed of Arizona, the diatom beds of Lompoc, California, and in many other formations. He also uses John McFarlane's Fishes the Source of Petroleum to demonstrate that these fish were entombed in oil. Of the organisms that have been described from these shells, the only group that would again explain the origins of the enormous quantities of oil sealed up in the rocks is that of fishes. Of the abundance of these, we have additional concurrent accounts above. In 1877, Cope wrote, the railroad cut through the buff of the west side of the Green River, Wyoming, at Green River City, has been known for some years for the numerous fishes preserved in the slate through which it is excavated. The Green River formation is also dated to the same epoch as that found in the Mont Bolca in Italy. Mainstream explanations would have that the old red sandstone strata had been laid down over a long time frame but when we examine the layers, they are very fine, thin layers. The fossils are distributed across this thin layer and would lead you to conclude that they were formed over millions of years. 
This would, however, mean that there would be something seriously wrong with the ocean, as it was killing whole populations across these millions of years. One aspect that I find particularly interesting about the old red sandstone is that it gains its red colour from iron, and this is the same reason that Mars is red too, so you can see an obvious connection there. If we take a little step backwards, there is much evidence that the idea of how strata are laid down is incorrect. Guy Berhalt is best known for demonstrating that these layers could be laid down in a very short time scale. But there is also the excellent work of both Andrew Hall and Peter Munger Yupp that also needs to be considered. This in itself is a topic worth spending more time on in a separate video. For now, let's take a simple example. We know that in the car industry they are able to paint very thin coats of paint on a car due to a process that gives the paint spray a charge. And the surface of the metal is given the opposite charge and this causes the fine mist to land on the surface in a very even and thin manner. Is it possible that what we are seeing in these thin layers of the old red sandstone is a similar process? Could the discharge elsewhere stir up fine particulates into the air which then become attracted to a differently charged surface? If this happened repeatedly, with slightly different compositions in the air, could this create a pattern that we see in the old red sandstone? There is a somewhat circular argument that the strata are dated by the fossils and that the fossils themselves are dated by the strata. An inconvenient truth is that we simply have no way of actually dating any of these layers. Looking at the finds in both North America and Italy, we see both the presence of a lot of oil and bitumen. Mainstream would account for the creation of these through very slow processes after the event. Again here we may start to consider the fact that this may have been part of the cause of their demise and was not formed after the event. This is also a topic that needs a more in-depth review of both the existing and alternative ideas around the formation of oil and bitumen. Belikovsky paints a picture of mass extinction through a single catastrophe. It is accepted that there have been at least two major extinction level events during the latter stages of the Devonian era around 360 million years ago and around 370 million years ago. This event is considered more severe than the Cretaceous event which supposedly wiped out the dinosaurs and may have wiped out as many as 75% of all the species on the planet. The cause of these events is still debated. Note how they spread the time of these two separate events over a 10 million year period to make it seem more gradual. We will examine the dating of each layer separately and would consider these dates as highly dubious, considering that there was 10 million years between these events which must have dramatically changed the landscape, why did these animals not evolve to adapt to their new environments? Is it not more likely that what we are seeing here is one single event? As always, be brave, be curious, the truth is waiting for us. Until next time.